Chapter 5 of Gullible's Travels, etc. by Ring Lardner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Three without, doubled. One. There ain't no immediate chance of you getting asked out to our house to dinner. Not while round steak and General Motors is selling at the same price, and common dog biscuits ten cents a loaf. But you might have nothing decent to do some evening, and happen to drop in on the missus and I for a call. So I feel like I ought to give you a little warning in case that comes off. You know there's lots of words that's called fightin' words. Some of them starts a brawl, no matter who they're spoke to. You can't call nobody a liar without expecting to lose a couple of milk teeth, that is, if the party addressed has got something besides lemon juice in his veins, and ain't had the misfortune to fall asleep on the panhandle tracks and be separated from his most prominent legs and arms. Then there's terms that don't hit you so much yourself, but reflects on your ancestors and prodigies, and you're supposed to resent em for the sake of honor and fix the speaker's map so as when he goes home his wife will say oh kitties come and look at the rainbow then there's other words and terms that you can call em to somebody and not get no rise but call em to somebody else and the insurance companies could hold out on your widow by claiming it was suicide for instance there's young harold griner one of the bookkeepers down to the office I could tell him he was an APA with a few adjectives, and he'd just smile and say, Quit your flirting. But I wouldn't never try that expression on Dan Cahill, the elevator starter, without being well out of his earshots. And I don't know what it means at that. Well, if you do come out to the house, there's a term that you want to lay off of when the missus is in the room. Don't say, San Susie. It sounds harmless enough, don't it? They ain't nothing to it even when it's transferred over from the latin without no cares but you just leave her here at mention and watch her grab the two deadliest weapons that's within reach one to use on you or whoever said it and the other on me on general principles you think i'm stringing you and i admit you got cause that is till you've heard the details of our latest plunge in the cesspools of society Two. It was a Friday evening about three weeks ago when I come home and found the wife quavering with excitement. Who do you think called up? she asked me. I got no idea, I says. Guess, says she. So I had to guess. Josephus Daniels, I says, or Henry Ford. Or maybe it was that guy with a scar on his lip that you thought was smiling at you the other day. You couldn't never guess, she says it was mrs messenger which one i asked her you can't mean mrs a d t messenger if you're so cute i won't tell you nothing about it says she don't make no rash threats i says you're going to tell me sometime and there's no use making yourself sick by trying to hold it in you know very well what mrs messenger i mean she says it was mrs robert messenger that's husband owns this building and the one at the corner where they live at. Haven't you paid the rent? I says. Do you think a woman like Mrs. Messenger would be buttoned into her husband's business? Says the missus. I don't know what kind of woman Mrs. Messenger is, I says, but if I owned these here apartments and somebody fell behind in their rent, I wouldn't be surprised to see the owner's wife going right over to their flat and taking it out of their trousers pocket. Well, says the wife, we don't owe them no rent, and that wasn't what she called me up about. It wasn't no business call. Go ahead and spill it, I says. My heart's weak. Well, she says, I was just getting through with the lunch dishes, and the phone rang. I bet you wondered who it was, says I. I thought it was Mrs. Hatcher somebody, says the wife. So I run to the phone, and it was Mrs. Messenger. So the first thing she says was to explain who she was, just like I didn't know, and the next thing she asked was, did I play bridge? And what did you tell her, says I? What do you think I'd tell her, says the missus? I told her yes. Wasn't you trifling a little with the truth, I asked her. Certainly not, she says. Haven't I played twice over at Hatches? So then she asked me if my husband played bridge too. And I told her, yes, he did. What was the idea, I says? You know I didn't never play it in my life. 
I don't know such a thing, she says. For all as I know, you may play all day down to the office. No, says I. We spend all our time down there playing post office with the scrub women. Well, anyway, I told her you did, says the missus. Don't you see there wasn't nothing else I could tell her? Because if I told her you didn't, that would have ended it. Ended what? I says. We wouldn't have been asked to the party, says the missus. Who told you there was going to be a party? I says. I don't have to be told everything, says the missus. I got brains enough to know that Mrs. Messenger ain't calling me up and asking me do we play bridge just because she's got a headache or feels lonesome or something. But it ain't only one party after all, and that's the best part of it. She asked us if we'd care to join the club. What club? says I. Mrs. Messenger's Club, the San Susie Club, says the missus. You've heard me speak about it a hundred times, and it's been mentioned in the papers once or twice, too. Once, anyway, when the members gave away them Christmas dinners last year. We can get into the papers, I says, without giving away no Christmas dinners. Who wants to get into the papers, says the wife. I don't care nothing about that. No, says I. I suppose if a reporter came out here and asked for your picture to stick in the society columns, you'd pick up the carving knife and run him ragged. I'd be polite to him at least, she says. Yes, says I. It wouldn't pay to treat him rude. It'd even be justifiable to lock him in while you was looking for the picture. If you kindly leave me talk, you may find out what I got to say, she says. I've told you about this club but i don't suppose you ever paid any attention it's a club that's made up from people that just lives in this block twenty of them all together and all but one couple either lives in this building or in the building the messengers lives in and they're all nice people people with real class to them not no tramps like most of the ones we've been running round with one of them's mr and mrs arthur collins that used to live on sheridan road and still goes over to parties at some of the most exclusive homes on the north side and they don't have nobody in the club that isn't congenial with each other but all just a nice crowd of real people that gets together once a week in one of the members houses and have a good time how did these pillows of society happen to light on to us i asked her well she says it seems the baileys who belong to the club went to california last week to spend the winter and they had to have a couple to take their place and mrs messenger says they wouldn't take nobody that didn't live in our block and her and her husband looked over the list and we was the ones they picked out probably i says that's because we was the only eligibles that can go out nights on account of not having no children the pearsons ain't asked she says and they ain't got no children well i says what's the dues there ain't no dues said the missus but once in a while instead of playing bridge everybody puts in two dollars apiece to have a theater party but the regular program is for an evening of bridge every tuesday night at different members houses somebody different acting as hosts every week and each couple puts up two dollars making ten dollars for a gent's prize and ten dollars for a lady's and the prizes is picked out by the lady that happens to be the hostess that's a swell proposition for me i says in the first place there wouldn't be a chance in the world for me to win a prize cause i don't know nothing about the game and in the second place suppose i had a whole lot of luck and did win the prize and come to find out it was a silver mustache cup that i wouldn't have no more use for than another adam's apple if they paid in cash there might be something to it if you win a prize you can sell it can't you says the missus besides the prizes don't count it's getting in with the right kind of people that makes the difference. Another thing, I says, when it comes our turn to have the party, where would we stick them all? We'd have to spread a sheet over the bathtub for one table and have one couple set on the edges and the other couple toss up for the wash basin and the clothes hamper. And another two couple would have to kneel around the bed and another bunch could stand up around the bureau. That'd leave the dining room table for the fourth set and for a special treat, the remaining four could play in the parlor. We could hire chairs and tables, says the missus. We're going to have to some time, anyway, when you or I die. <laughs> you don't need to hire no tables for my funeral, I says. If the pallbearers of the quartet insists on shooting craps, they can use the kitchen floor. Or if they want beer and sandwiches, you can slip them the money to go down to the corner. There's no use worrying about our end of it yet, 
says the wife. We'll be new members, and they won't expect us to give no party till everybody else has had their turn. I only got one objection left, I says. How am I going to get by at a bridge party when I haven't no idea how many cards to deal? I guess you can learn if I learned, she says. You're always talking about what a swell card player you are. And besides, you've played whist, and ain't hardly any difference. And the next party is next Tuesday night, I says. Yes, says the missus, at Mrs. Garrett's, the best player in the club, and one of the smartest women in Chicago, Mrs. Messenger says. She lives at the same building with the messengers, and they's dinner first, and then we play bridge all evening. And maybe, I says, before the evening's over, I'll find out what's trumps. You'll know all about the game before that, she says. Right after supper, we'll get out the cards, and I'll show you. So right after supper, she got out the cards and began to show me. But about all as I learnt was one thing, and that was if I died without no insurance, the missus would stand a better show of supporting herself by umpiring baseball in the National League than by teaching in a bridge whist university. She knew everything except about how much the different suits counted, and how many points was in a game, and what honors meant, and who done the first bidding, and how much to bid on what. After about an hour of it, I says, I can see you got this thing mastered. But you're like a whole lot of other people that knows something perfect themselves, but can't learn it to nobody else. No, she says. I got to admit that I don't know as much as I thought I did. I didn't have no trouble when I was playing with Mrs. Hatch and Mrs. Pearson and Mrs. Kramer, but it seems like I forgot all they learnt me. It's a crime, I says, that we should have to pass up this chance to get in right, just because we can't play a fool game of cards. Why don't you call up Mrs. Messenger and suggest that the San Susie switches to Pedro or 500 or Rummy or, or something that you don't need to take no college course in? You're full of brilliant ideas, says the missus. There's only just the one game the society plays, and that's bridge. Them other games is jokes. I have noticed you always treated them that way, I says, but they wasn't so funny to me when it came time to settle. I'll tell you what we'll do, says the missus. We'll call up Mr. and Mrs. Hatch and tell them to come over here tomorrow night and give us a lesson. That'd be sweet, I says, asking them to learn us a game so as we could join a club that's right here in their neighborhood, but they ain't even been asked to join it. Why, you rummy, she says. We don't have to tell them why we want to learn. We just say that my two attempts over to their house has got me interested, and I and you want to master the game so as we can spend many pleasant evenings with them, because Mrs. Hatch has told me a hundred times that her and her husband would rather play bridge than eat. So she called up Mrs. Hatch and sprung it on her. But it seemed like the Hatches had an engagement for Saturday night, but would be tickled to death to come over Monday evening and give us a workout. After that was fixed, we both felt kind of ashamed of ourselves, deceiving people that was supposed to be our best friends. But anyway, the missus says, the Hatches would never fit in with that crowd. Jim always looks like he'd dressed on the elevated, and Mrs. Hatch can't talk about nothing, only chiropody. On the Saturday I tried to slip one over by buying a book called Auction Bridge, and I read it all the way home from town and then left it on the car. It was a great book for a man that had learned the rudderments, and I wanted to find out how to play the game right. But for me to try and get something out of it was just as though some kid had learned the baseball guide by heart in kindergarten and then asked Hugh Jennings for the job in center field. I did find out one thing from it, though. It says that in every deal, one of the players was a dummy and just laid his cards down and left somebody else play them. So when I got home, I says, We won't need no help from Jim Hatch and his wife. We can just be dummies all the evening, and they won't nobody know if we're ignorant or not. That's impossible to be dummy all the time, says the missus. Not for me, I says. I know it'll be tough for you, but you can chew a lot of gum and you won't mind it so much. You don't understand she says. The dummy is the partner of the party that gets the bid. Suppose one of the people that was playing against you got the bid. Then the other one would be dummy, and you'd have to play your hand. But I don't need to leave them have the bid, I says. I can take it away from them. And if you take it away from them, she says, then you got the bid yourself, and your partner's dummy, not you. Well, the hatches breezed in Monday night, and Mrs. Hatch remarked how tickled she was that we was going to learn and what good times we for to have playing together. 
and the missus and I pretended like we shared her raptures. "'Ain't you never played at all?' she asked me, and I told her no. "'The first thing,' she says, "'is how much the different suits counts, and then they's the bids, and you got to pay attention to the conventions.' "'I'm through with them forever,' I says, "'since they turned down Roosevelt.' "'Well, we started in, and Hatch and the missus played Mrs. Hatch and I. "'We kept at it till pretty near midnight, with three or four intermissions, "'so as Hatch could relieve the strain on the ice-box. "'My whist education kept me from being much of a flivver when it came to playing the cards, "'but I don't care how bright a guy is, you just can't learn everything about bidding in one evening, "'and you can't remember half what you learn." i don't know what the score was when we got through but the hatches done most of the execution and held most of the cards which is their regular habit you'll get along all right says mrs hatch when they was ready to go but of course you can't expect to master a game like bridge in a few hours you want to keep at it we're going to says the missus maybe it'd be a good idea says mrs hatch to play again soon before you forget what we learnt you why don't you come over to our house for another session tomorrow night let's see tomorrow night says the mrs stalin why no we can't we got an engagement so mrs hatch stood there like she was expecting to hear what it was we're going to a party says the wife oh tell me about it says mrs hatch well says the missus it ain't really a party it's just kind of a party some old friends that's visiting in town maybe they'll play bridge with you says mrs hatch oh no says the missus blushing it'll probably be rummy or pedro or maybe we'll just go to the pictures why don't you go over to the acme says mrs hatch they got chaplin in the street sweeper we're going and we could meet you and all go together N no says the wife you see one of our friends has just lost his wife and i know he wouldn't feel like going to see something funny he's already laughed himself sick i says well we wouldn't make no date with em and they finally blew with the understanding that we was to go to their house and play some night soon when they'd went the missus says i feel like a criminal deceiving them like that but i just couldn't tell em the truth bertha hatch is the most jealous thing in the world and it would just about kill her to know that we was in on something good without she and jim if you hadn't asked him over i says we'd have been just as well off and you wouldn't have had to make a perjure out of yourself what do you mean we'd have been just as well off she says they done what we expected of em learn us the game yes i says and you could take all i remember of the lesson and feed it to a gnat and he'd say hurry up with the soup course three well, Mrs. Garrett had called up to say that the feed before the game would begin at seven bells, so I and the missus figured on being on hand at half-past six so as to get acquainted with some of our fellow club members and know what to call them when we wanted the gravy passed or something. But I had trouble with my studs, and it wasn't till pretty near twenty minutes to seven that we rung the Garrett's bell. The hired girl let us in and left us standing in the hall while she went to tell Mrs. Garrett we was there. Pretty soon the girl come back and says she would take our wraps and that Mrs. Garrett would be with us in a few minutes. So we were showed into the living room. The apartment was on the second floor and looked about twice as big as iron. "'What do you suppose this costs them?' asked the missus. "'About fifty-five a month,' I says. "'You're crazy,' says she. "'They got this big living room and two bedrooms and a maid's room and a sun parlor, "'besides their dining room and kitchen and bath. "'They're lucky if they ain't stuck for seventy. "'I'll bet you,' I says. "'I'll bet you it's nearer fifty-five than seventy. "'How much will you bet?' she says. "'Anything you say,' says I. "'Well,' she says, "'I've got a cinch, and I need a pair of black silk stockings. "'My others has begun to run.' all right i says a pair of black silk stockings to fifty cents cash you're on she says and i'll call up the agent tomorrow and find out well it must have been pretty near seven o'clock when mrs garrett finally showed up good evening she says i suppose this must be our new members i'm awfully glad you could come and i'm sorry i wasn't quite ready that's all right i says i'm glad to know these others has trouble getting into their evening clothes i suppose people that does it often enough finally gets to be experts i didn't have no trouble 
says Mrs. Garrett, only I didn't expect nobody till seven o'clock. You must have misunderstood me and thought I said half-past six. Then Mr. Garrett came in and shook hands with us, and then the rest of the folks began to arrive and we was introduced to them all. I didn't catch all of their names, only a Mr. and Mrs. Messenger, and a Mr. and Mrs. Collins, and a Mr. and Mrs. Sparks. Mrs. Garrett says dinner was ready, and I was glad to hear it. They set me down between Mrs. Messenger and a lady that I didn't get her name. Well, I says to Mrs. Messenger, now we know you personally, we can pay the rent direct without bothering to go to the real estate office. I'm afraid that wouldn't do, she says. Our agent's entitled to his commissions, and besides, I wouldn't know how much to take or nothing about it. We pay thirty-five, I says, and that's all as you could ask for, seeing as we only got the four rooms and no sun parlor. Thirty-two and a half would be about the right price. You'll have to argue that with our agent, she says. I was kind of expecting a cocktail, but nothing doing. The hired girl brought in some half sandwiches, made a toast with something on them that looked like BB shot and tasted like New Year's morning. Don't we get no liquid refreshments? I asked Mrs. Messenger. No, indeed, she says. The San Susie's a dry club. You should ought to call it the San Sousy, then, says I. The missus was sitting next to Mr. Garrett, and I could hear him talking about what a nice neighborhood it was and how they liked their flats. I thought I and the missus might as well settle our bet right then and there, so I spoke to Mr. Garrett across the table. Mr. Garrett, I says, while we was waiting for you and your wife to get dressed, I and the missus made a little bet, a pair of silk stockings against half a buck. I got to pay out two dollars here for the prize, and the missus claims her other stockings has begun to run, so you might say we're both a little anxious. Is it something I can settle? he asked. Yes, sir, I says, because we was betting on the rent you paid for this apartment. The missus says seventy a month, and I says fifty-five. I never decide against the lady, he says. You better buy the stockings before the others run so far they can't find their way home. If I lose, I lose, says I, but if you're stuck sixty-five or better, the missus must have steered me wrong about the number of rooms you got. I'll pay, though, because I don't ever welch on a bet, so this party's really costing me two and a half instead of two. Maybe you'll win the prize, says Mr. Garrett. There ain't much chance, I says. I ain't never played this game for a long while. Why, your wife was just telling me you played last night, he says. I mean, says I, that I didn't play for a long while before last night. Not for thirty-six years, I says. Well, when everybody got through choking down the shot, they brought in some drowned toadstools, and then some little slices of beef about the size of a checker, and seven Saratoga chips apiece, and half a dozen string beans. Those that was still able to set up under this load finished off on sliced tomatoes that was caught too young, and a nickel's worth of ice cream and an eyedropper full of coffee. Before I forget it, says Mrs. Collins, while we was staggering out of the dining room, you're all coming to my house next Tuesday night. I was walking right behind her. And I got a suggestion for you, I says, low enough so as they couldn't nobody else hear. Throw in some of the prize money into the dinner, and if there's any skimpin' to be done, do it on the prizes. She didn't say nothing back, because Mrs. Garrett had started to hand us the little cards that showed us where we was to play. I suppose I'd better tell you our rules, she says to me. Each table plays four deals. Then the winners moves while the losers set still, except at the first table, where the winners set still and the losers moves. You change partners after every four deals. You count fifty for a game and a hundred and fifty for a rubber. The way I been playing, I says, it was thirty for a game. I never heard of that, she says, but I noticed when we got to playing that everybody had made thirty points called it a game. Don't we see the prizes before we start? I asked her. I want to know whether to play my best or not. If you win the prize and don't like it, she says, I guess you can get it exchanged. They tell me you're the shark amongst the woman folks, says I, so it's a safe bet that you didn't pick out no lady's prize that isn't okay. I noticed some of the other men was slipping her their ante, so I parted with a two-spot. Then I found where I was to set at. It was table number three, couple number one. 
My partner was a strappin' big woman with a name something like Rowley or Phillips. Our opponents was Mrs. Garrett and Mr. Messenger. Mrs. Garrett looked like she'd been livin' on the kind of a meal she'd gave us, and Mr. Messenger could have sat in the back seat of a fliver with two regular people without crowdin' nobody. So I says to my partner, Well, partner, we got em out weighed anyway. There was two decks of cards on the table. I grabbed one of em and began to deal em face up. First Jack, I says. If you don't mind, we'll cut for deal, says Mrs. Garrett. So we cut the cards, and it seemed like the low cut got the deal, and that was Mrs. Garrett herself. Which deck'll we play with? I asked. Both of them, says Mrs. Garrett. Mr. Messenger will make them red ones for you. Make em, I says. Well, Messenger, I didn't know you was a card factory. Messenger laughed, but the two ladies didn't get it. Mrs. Garrett dealt, and it was her turn to bid. One without, she says. I'd feel better if I had one within, says I. Are you going to bid or not? she asked me. I thought it was the dealer's turn first, I says. I've made my bid, she says. I bid one without. One without looking or what? I says. One no trump, if I've got to explain it, she says. Oh, that's different, I says. But I found out that most all of them said one without when they meant one no trump. I looked at my hand, but about all as I had was four hearts with the king and jack high. Pardner, I says, I don't see nothing I can bid unless it be one heart. Does that hit you? No talking cross the boards, says Mrs. Garrett, and besides, one heart ain't over my bid. So I passed, and Mr. Messenger bid two spades. Then my partner passed, and Mrs. Garrett thought it over a while, and then bid two without. So I passed again, and the rest of them passed, and it was my first lead. Well, I didn't have only one spade, the eight spot, and I knew it wouldn't do my hand no good as long as I couldn't trump in with it, so I let it out. Messenger was dummy, and he laid his hand down. He had about eight spades with an ace and queen high. I might as well take a chance, says Mrs. Garrett, and she throwed on Messenger's ten spot. Out come my partner with a king, and it was our trick. What kind of a lead was that? says Mrs. Garrett to me. Pretty good one, I guess, says I. It fooled you, anyway. And she acted like she was sore as a boil. Come to find out, she thought I was leading from the king and was going to catch it later on. Well, her and Messenger took all the rest of the tricks except my king of hearts, and they had a game on us, besides forty for their four aces. I could have made a little slam as well as not she says when it was over, but I misunderstood our friend's lead. It's the first time I ever seen a man lead from a sneak and no trump. I'll do a whole lot of things you never seen before, I says. I don't doubt it, says she, still acting like I'd spilled salad dressing on her skirt. It was my first bid next time, and Hart's was my only suit again. I had the ace, queen, and three others. Pardon her, I says. I'm going to bid one heart, and if you got something to help me out with, don't let him take it away from me. I'll double a heart, says Messenger. Oh, somebody else is getting cute, says I. Well, I'll double right back at you. Will you just wait until it comes your turn, says Mrs. Garrett, and besides, you can't redouble. I guess I can, says I. I got five of them. It's against our rules, she says. So my partner done nothing, as usual, and Mrs. Garrett bid one without again. I guess you want to play em all, I says, but you got to come higher than that. I'm going to bid two hearts. Two no trump, says Messenger, and my partner says pass once more. You'll get a sore throat saying that, I told her. Don't you ever hold nothing? It don't look like it, she says. Maybe you don't know what's worth bidding on, I says. Maybe she'd better take a few lessons from you, says Mrs. Garrett. No, I says, kidding her. You don't want no more female experts in the club, or you might have to buy some cut glass once in a while instead of winning it. Well, I bid three hearts, but Mrs. Garrett come up to three no trump, and I couldn't go no higher. This time I let out my ace of hearts, hoping maybe to catch their king, but I didn't get it. And Mrs. Garrett copped all the rest of them for a little slam. If your husband ever starts drinking hard, I says, you can support yourself by selling some of your horseshoes to the Russian government. 
It was no lie, neither. I never seen such hands as that woman held, and messengers was pretty near as good. In the four deals, they grabbed two rubbers and a couple of little slams, and when they left our table, they had over nine hundred to our nothing. Mr. Collins and another woman was the next ones to set down with us. The rules was to change partners, and Collins took the one I'd been playing with. And what does she do but get lucky, and then they give us another tribute, though nothing near as bad as the first one. My partner this time was a woman about forty-eight, and she acted like it was way past her bedtime. When it was her turn to say something, we always had to wait about five minutes, and all the other tables was through a long while before us. Once, she says, you'll have to excuse me tonight. I don't somehow seem to be able to keep my mind on the game. No, I says, but I bet you'd perk up if the lady's prize was a mattress. When you're going to be up late, you should ought to take a nap in the afternoon. Well, sir, my next partner wasn't nobody else but the missus. She'd started at the fourth table and lost the first time, but win the second. She'd come along with the husband of the partner I'd just had. So here we was, family against family, you might say. What kind of luck you been having? The fellow asked me. No luck at all, I says, but if you're anywhere near as sleepy as your missus, I and my wife ought to clean up this time. We didn't. They held all the cards except in one hand, and that was the one my missus tried to play. I bid first and made it a no trump, as there was three aces in my hand. Old Slumber began to talk in her sleep and says, Two diamonds. The missus bid two hearts. Mr. Sleeper passed, and so did I, as I didn't have a single heart in my hand and figured the missus probably had them all. She had six, with the king high and then the nine spot. Our female opponent only had two, and that left five for her husband, including the ace, queen, and jack. We was set three. Nice work, I says to the missus. You're the Philadelphia Athletics of Auction Bridge. What was you bidding no trump on, she says. I thought, of course, you'd have one high heart and some suit. You don't want to start thinking at your age, I says. You can't learn an old dog new tricks. Mrs. Knapp's husband cut in. Of course, he says, it's a man's privilege to call your wife anything you feel like calling her, but your missus don't hardly look old to me. No, not comparatively speaking, I says, and he shut up. They moved on, and along come Garrett and Mrs. Messenger. I and Mrs. Messenger was partners, and I thought for a while we was going to win, but Garrett and the missus had a bouquet of four-leaf clovers in the last two deals and licked us. Garrett wasn't supposed to be as smart as his wife, but he was fox enough to keep bidding over my missus so as he'd do the playing instead of she. It wasn't till pretty near the close of the evening's entertainment that I got away from that table and moved to number two. When I sat down there, it was I and Mrs. Collins against her husband and Mrs. Sleeper. Well, Mrs. Collins, I says, I'll try and hold some good hands for you, and maybe I can have two helpings of the meat when we come to your house. The other lady opened her eyes long enough to ask who was winning. Oh, Mrs. Garrett's way ahead, says Mrs. Collins. She's got a score of something like three thousand, and Mr. Messenger is high amongst the men. Who's next to the leading lady? I asked her. I guess I am, she says, but I'm three hundred behind Mrs. Garrett. Well, the luck I just bumped into stayed with me, and I and Mrs. Collins won and moved to the head table. Waiting there for us was our darling hostess and messenger, the two leaders in the pennant race. It was give out that this was to be the last game. When Mrs. Garrett realized who was going to be her partner, I wished you could have seen her face. This is an unexpected pleasure, she says to me. I thought you liked the third table so well you was going to stay there all evening. I did intend to, I says, but I seen you up here and I heard you was leading the league, so I thought I'd like to help you finish in front. I don't need no help, she says. All I ask is for you to not overbid your hands, and I'll do the rest. How many are you, Mrs. Garrett? asked Mrs. Collins. Thirty-two hundred and sixty, she says. Oh, my, says Mrs. Collins, I'm hopeless. I'm only twenty-nine hundred and forty-eight. And how about you, Mr. Messenger? Round thirty-one hundred, he says. Yes, says Mrs. Garrett, and I don't believe any of the rest of the men is within five hundred of that. 
"'Well, messenger,' I says, "'if the men's prize happens to be a case of beer "'or a steak smothered in onions, "'don't forget that I'm paying you thirty-five a month "'for a thirty-dollar flat.' "'Well, I'd have give my right eye "'to see Mrs. Collins beat Mrs. Garrett out. "'But I was going to do my best for Mrs. Garrett just the same, "'because I don't think it's square for a man "'not to try and play your hardest all the time "'in any kind of a game, "'no matter where your sympathies lays. So when it came my turn to bid on the first hand, and I seen the ace and king and four other hearts in my hand, I raised Mrs. Collins' bid of two diamonds, and Mrs. Garrett made it a two-no trump and got away with it. On the next two deals, Messenger and Mrs. Collins made a game, and Mrs. Garrett got set a trick once on a bid of five clubs. The way the score was when it came to the last deal, I figured that if Mrs. Collins and Messenger made another game and rubber, the two women would be mighty close to even. Mrs. Garrett dealt him and says, One without. Two spades, says Mrs. Collins. Well, sir, there wasn't a spade in my hand, and I seen that if Mrs. Collins got it, we was ruined on account of me not having a trump. And while I wanted Mrs. Collins to win, I was going to do my best to not let her. So I says, Two without. You know what you're doing, do you? says Mrs. Garrett. What do you mean, know what I'm doing? I says. Now talking across the boards, says Messenger. All right, I says, but you can depend on me, partner, not to throw you down. Well, Messenger passed, and so did Mrs. Garrett, but Mrs. Collins wasn't through. Three spades, she says. Three without, says I. I hope it's all right, says Mrs. Garrett. I'll tell you one thing, I says, it's a whole lot all righter than if she played it in spades. Messenger passed again, and ditto for my partner. "'I'll double,' says Mrs. Collins, and we let it go at that. "'Man, oh, man, you ought to seen our genial hostess when I laid down my cards. And heard her, too, her face all three colors of old glory. She slammed her hand down on the table face up. "'I won't play it,' she hollers. "'I won't be made a fool of. This poor idiot deliberately told me he had spades stopped.' and look at his hand. You're mistaken, Mrs. Garrett, I says. I didn't say nothing about spades. Shut your mouth. That's what you ought to have done all evening. My mind is well of, I says, for all the good it done me to keep it open at dinner. Everybody in the room quit playing and rubbered. Finally Garrett got up from where he was sitting and come over. What seems to be the trouble, he says. This ain't no bar room. Nobody had ever suspected to be in, I says. Look at what he done, says Mrs. Garrett. He raised my no trump bid over three spades without a spade in his hand. Well, says Mr. Garrett, there's no use getting all fussed up over a game of cards. The thing to do is pick up your hand and play it out and take your medicine. I can set her three, says Mrs. Collins. I got seven spades with the ace, king, and queen, and I'll catch her jack on the third lead. And I got the ace of hearts says Messenger. Even if I didn't take a trick, it'd make aces easy. So our three hundred above the line gives Mrs. Collins a score of about ten more than Mrs. Garrett. All right, then, says Garrett. Mrs. Collins is entitled to the lady's prize. I don't want to take it, says Mrs. Collins. You got to take it, says Garrett. And he gave his wife a look that meant business. Anyway, she got up and went out of the room. And when she came back, she was smiling. She had two packages in her hand, and she gave one to Messenger and one to Mrs. Collins. There's the prizes, she says, and I hope you'll like them. Messenger unwrapped his in, and it was one of them round leather cases that you use to carry extra collars in when you're traveling. Messenger had told me earlier in the evening that he hadn't been outside of Chicago in six years. Mrs. Collins' prize was a chafing dish. I don't blame Mrs. Garrett for her being so crazy to win it. I says to her when they couldn't nobody hear. Her and Garrett both must get hungry about nine or ten p.m. I hate to take it, says Mrs. Collins. I wouldn't feel that way, I says. I guess Mrs. Garrett will chafe enough without it. When we was ready to go, I shook hands with the host and hostess, and says I was sorry if I'd pulled a boner. It was to be expected, says Mrs. Garrett. Yes, I says. A man's liable to do most anything when he's starving to death. The messengers and Collinses was a little ways ahead of us on the stairs, and I wanted we should hurry and catch up with them. 
"'You let them go,' says the missus. "'You've spoiled everything now, without doing nothing more. "'Every time you talk, you insult somebody.' "'I ain't going to insult them,' I says. "'I'm just going to ask them to go down to the corner and have a drink.' "'You are not,' she says. "'But she's just as good a prophet as she is a bridge player. "'They wouldn't go along, though, saying it was late and they wanted to get to bed. "'Well, if you won't, you won't,' says I. "'We'll see you all a week from tonight. "'And don't forget, Mrs. Collins, that I'm responsible for you winning that chafing dish, "'and I'm fond of Welch rabbits.' I was glad that we didn't have to go far to our building. The missus was pleasant company, just like a bloodhound with a rabies. I left her in the vestibule and went down to help Mike close up. He likes to be amongst friends at a sad hour like that. At breakfast the next morning, the wife was more calm. Dearie, she says, they don't neither one of us class as bridge experts. I'll admit I got a lot to learn about the game. What we want to do is play with the hatches every evening this week, and maybe by next Tuesday night we'll know something. I'm willing, I says. I'll call Mrs. Hatch up this forenoon, she says, and see if they want us to come over there this evening. But if we do go, remember not to mention our club or tell them anything about the party. Well, she had news for me when I got home. The sand Susie's is busted up, she says. Not forever, but for a few months, anyway. Mrs. Messenger called up to tell me. "'What's the idea?' I says. "'I don't know exactly,' says the missus. "'Mrs. Messenger says that the Collinses had boxes for the opera every Tuesday night, and the rest didn't feel like going on without the Collinses, and they couldn't all of them agree on another night.' "'I don't see why they should bust it up on account of one couple,' I says. "'Why don't you tell them about the hatches? They're right here in the neighborhood and can play bridge as good as anybody.' I wouldn't think of doing it, says she. They may play all right, but think of how they'll talk, how they'll dress. Well, I says, between you and I, I ain't going to take cyanide over a piece of news like this. Somehow it don't appeal to me to vote myself dry every Tuesday night all winter, to say nothing of two dollars a week annual dues to help buy a prize that I got no chance of winning and wouldn't know what to do with if I had it. It'd be kind of nice, though, she says, to make friends with them people. Well, I says, I feel a whole lot more confident of doing that if I see them once a year, or not at all. 4. I can tell you the rest of it in about a minute. The missus had become resigned, and everything was going along smooth until last Tuesday evening. There was a new chaplain show over to the Acme, and we was on our way to see it. At the entrance to the building where the messengers lives, we see Mr. and Mrs. Hatch. "'Hello there,' says the wife. "'Better come along with us to the Acme.' "'Not tonight,' says Mrs. Hatch. "'We're tied up every Tuesday evening.' "'Some club?' asks the missus. "'Yes,' says Mrs. Hatch. "'It's a bridge club, the San Susie. "'The messengers and Collinses and Garrett's and us "'and some other people's in it. Two weeks ago we was to the Collinses, and last week to Beardsley's, and tonight the Messengers is the hosts. The missus tried to say something, and couldn't. "'I've been awful lucky,' says Mrs. Hatch. "'I won the prize at Collinses. It was a silver pitcher, the prettiest you ever seen.' The missus found her voice. "'Do you have dinner, too?' she asked. "'I should say we do.' says Mrs. Hatch, and simply grand stuff to eat. It was nice last week at Beardsley's, but you ought to have been at Collins's. First there was an old-fashioned beefsteak supper, and then when we was through playing, Mrs. Collins made us Welch rabbits in her chafing dish. That don't tempt me, I says. I'd as soon try and eat a raw muskrat as a Welch rabbit. Well, we got to be going in, says Hatch. Good night, says Mrs. Hatch, and I wished you was coming with us. The picture we saw was called The Fly Cop. Don't never waste a dime on it. There ain't a laugh in the whole show. End of Three Without Doubled End of Gullible's Travels, etc. by Ring Lardner Recording by Winston Tharp